Come on. First Peter chapter 3 is where we're going to be. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Robin. I'm the lead pastor here at Live Church, and I am just so excited about church. Every week, come on, is anybody excited about church? You know, it's a privilege that we get to do this thing. It's a, a privilege and an honor that we get to be here on Sunday night to open the word, to, to worship, to sit next to a brother and a sister in faith. And so if you're new, I want you to know you're welcome here. If you're here and you're asking questions about faith, you're asking questions about who Jesus is, I want you to know your questions, no matter how hard they are, no matter how deep they are, they are welcome. We're excited that you're here. And uh, tonight we are talking about relationships. <laughs> I was interesting, it was, it was a little curious to see what your response would be. I, we're, we're talking about relationships. Uh, you know, the, the romantic kind. Last time I did a relationship sermon, it was not the romantic kind, and I think people were kind of a little bit disappointed. Um, but this one, we're talking, we're talking about marriage tonight. Um, that was like the married crowd in the front here, <laughs> giving the shout outs. You know, this year I did, uh, I lost track of how many weddings I did. I think it was seven, but I went to nine. Um, last year I did a bunch. You can imagine at Lift Church, we do a lot of weddings. Really excited. We got some weddings coming up next year. And uh, it's, a big, it's a big part of, of the stage that many of you are in in our church. There's a diverse mix of people, but a lot of people are asking questions about marriage, asking questions about what does it look like, how do we frame it, how do we understand it. And uh, I'm excited to unpack it tonight. But I do want to say that not everybody in the room is in the phase of, of marriage. Not obviously all of you are, are married, and some of you are in a place where you're yearning, you're yearning and, and asking questions, going, God, what does my relationship future look like? Others of you are in a relationship that is struggling, maybe even a marriage that is struggling. And I believe tonight is for you. Tonight is for the, those of you that are yearning. Tonight is for those of you that are completely satisfied where you are. And it's for those of you that are completely dissatisfied where you are. And so can we pray before we get into the word tonight? Can we do that? My questions are not always rhetorical. I want to know that when we pray, we pray as a church. We pray together. So Jesus, we come to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you want to speak to us tonight. And so, Father, as we unpack a challenging word, I pray that you would unearth our presuppositions, unearth the baggage that we've come in with, and do away with it, Lord. That we would walk out a free people, a liberated people by the goodness of your truth, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I do want to say that, uh, hmm, nope, I'm going to save that for two weeks. Um, if you're here and you're feeling a little crowded, um, Welcome. Hopefully we won't always be crowded. <laughs> and so for those of you on the back right here, we love you. We're glad you're here. Lean in. Lean in. I know you got like the cheap seats at the back. Uh, it's okay. We still love you. Is that cool? Can we give a big shout out to the people on the other side of the curtain? Cool. Cool, cool. Okay. Okay. Peter is in the midst of reframing our relationships. He's in the midst of completely changing the way we relate to people in this book. It's a letter that he wrote to a church that was suffering, that was struggling to understand their identity and where they're going. Two weeks ago, we talked about how the church is not just a, an event we participate in or a, a product we consume or a people that we tolerate. No, the church is family. And so we cast a new vision, a new understanding, a new beautiful picture of what the relationships, even in this room tonight, could be. Last week, Alex uh, softened you guys up a little bit uh, with a pretty challenging message about how we relate to authority. And I, I just want to recognize that Alex did a commendable job handling a very challenging piece of Scripture. See, one of the things we value as a church is we, we don't come to Scripture and say, how do we just say what we want to say? No, we come to Scripture and say, Scripture, what are you saying? 
We believe the truth is in the scripture and our job and my job as a preacher and as a pastor to try to unpack it for you tonight. My prayer is that it wouldn't be my ideas, but the truth of scripture that would resonate this evening. But tonight we're just continuing on where Peter left off. He starts by talking about brothers and sisters. Then he talks about slaves. It was intense submitting to their masters. And then this week we're talking about husbands and wives. And so let's pick it up. First Peter chapter 3. If you're there, say, I'm there. Everybody else is on the screen. In the same way, everybody say, same way. You wives must accept the authority of your husbands. For those of you that just got your knickers in or not, don't worry. We're going to completely mess you up by the end of the night. <laughs> then, even if some of you refuse to obey the good news, <clears throat> your godly lives will speak to them, that's the husbands, without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Don't be concerned about your outward beauty, your fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, your Lululemon, or your beautiful clothes. It's there. I don't know what version you guys have. Seaweed clothing was popular even back then. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. For the other half of the room that just got your knickers in or not. Not done with you yet either. We're going to get there. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. In the same way, everybody say same way. You husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. So there's a real urge culturally in the 21st century to go to a text like this and spend a great deal of time explaining how Peter didn't really mean what he said. He didn't really intend to say, he, he, we're, we're misunderstanding, we need, to, we need to put our 21st century glasses on and read it properly. There's a real urge, if we're honest tonight, where we get to those moments where it talks about master and obedience and go, well, I didn't really mean it, and to start to turn the text inside out and try to make it say something different. But my hope and my prayer tonight is that we wouldn't pander and we wouldn't lead based on what our 21st century Western perspective says about the text. No, what we would do is we would lean into the text and say, Jesus, what are you trying to say to us tonight? That rather than allowing our offense at what has been said to dictate our application of it, we would humble ourselves and say, Jesus, maybe you actually want to speak to me tonight. You see, the my hope and my prayer is that we wouldn't walk a middle ground kind of between, like it didn't really mean it, but it kind of did say it, so we got to figure out what it means. No, my prayer is that we would lean in, that we would discover tonight the incredible picture that Peter is painting of our relationships by fully embracing what is said. The objective tonight is for us as a church to start to catch a picture of just how beautiful a biblical understanding of relationships is. Just how incredible freeing, incredibly freeing and liberating some of the ideas and principles and truths that are contained in Scripture really are. And so with that said, I think we need to unpack a little bit of context about what's happening in this letter that Peter is writing. So the first thing we have to understand is that <clears throat> there were many, many more women that were coming to faith than there were men in the early church. In the first days of the church, it was much more common for the women of, of the Roman Empire to, to step into relationship with Jesus than it was for the men. Kind of like in this room sometimes. Where are the dudes? 
Can I get an amen from the front? Some of the girls, some of you sisters are going, amen. I'm not lack of my odds in this room. I'm just going to call it how it is sometimes, you know. There were many more women that were coming to faith than there were men. And as you can imagine, this was creating some interesting situations. Because what would happen is a woman would come to faith, but her husband wouldn't. And so now you've got a dilemma going on where all of a sudden you have a woman that's following Jesus, a wife who is following Jesus, and a husband who is not. And this starts to introduce some tensions, as you can imagine. This was exacerbated by the fact that women were in no way equal to men. They were ranked slightly above slaves and children, but definitely below men and certainly below the father or the head of the household. And so as a result, the balance of power in a relationship in the first century in Jesus' time, the balance of power was held by the men. They could actually do things as extreme as determine whether a baby would live or die. They could throw out babies. They, the men could visit prostitutes as they saw fit. It's interesting that while there isn't a ton of accounts of abuse, it wouldn't necessarily have caused major problems. Now, I do want to highlight that this text is not speaking tonight to abuse. It is not speaking to violence in a relationship. It's speaking to the relational tension that existed between those that followed Jesus and those that did not. But more importantly and more specifically, there's a piece of context that changes everything about the way we understand this letter. This letter was to a church that was suffering. Nero was killing Christians left, right, and center. And so Peter writes a letter to help the Christian world exist within a Roman Empire that wants to terminate them. And so he's not writing a letter that is a political manifesto or a treatise on gender norms. No, he's writing a letter to pastorally encourage and walk with the church. Do you see how that changes the way we understand it? Peter's concern here is how does the church thrive in a world that hates it? How do husbands and wives thrive in a culture that is saying you need to live a certain way? And more importantly, he's asking the question, the question that I hope you are asking tonight, which is how are you glorifying Jesus in your relationships? How do the relationships that you're in or want to be in or not in or want to get out of, how are they glorifying Jesus? That is the question we're going to answer tonight. And so there's four words I want to unpack, four things that I think we need to rethink, reimagine, and re-understand. And as I started to write these, this was supposed to be a one-week sermon. It is going to be a two-week sermon. <laughs> Happened again. There's no way I can preach this in one week. And so we're going to do the first two words this week and the second two words next week. Does that sound good? The first word that we're going to rethink is service. And the second word we're going to rethink is satisfaction. They all start with S. Very clever, right? And this next two S's we'll find out next week. You know, let's come back to church. The first S, service. Check it out. So verse 1 and verse 7 both say something incredibly challenging and incredibly profound. In the same way, everybody say same way. It's very important that we understand this. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. And then he jumps down to the husbands and he says, In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat her with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. There's these two specific instructions, one to the men and one to the women, one to the wives and then one to the husbands. And as we come to them, it almost seems unfair, doesn't it? It almost seems like the men get the super easy deal. All they got to do is like their wives. 
And the wives have to be obedient. What, what is going on in this text? How is this so unfair? We almost bristle against it. Some of you get your, your back up. You get a little bit defensive at this idea of this tension in the text. And if I'm honest, part of me wants to just not read this part of Scripture because it's hard. I've been wrestling with this text for weeks and weeks and weeks. Alex said last week when we preach, we don't just preach flippantly. We wrestle deeply. And so I've been wrestling with this going, God, what is going on in this text? It feels unfair. It doesn't feel right. You see, what we do in our relationships is we start to play a game. And the game is this. It's the game of who gets the power. The game of who gets the power. And what we do is we look at this and we go, it's unfair. It seems like the wives get no power and the husbands are empowered to basically just tell them to do whatever they want them to do. I believe this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what Peter is getting at. You see, when we do this, when we start to cry out, isn't it unfair isn't it not right? Who gets the power? We start to play the game. We are missing the broader narrative and picture of how beautiful and life-giving relationships in Scripture really are. We've missed the entire narrative, not just of Peter, but of all of Scripture, when we respond by saying, this isn't fair. You're going, Raman, you've, you've said a lot, but you've not explained it yet. There's a fascinating little bit in Genesis chapter 3. A fascinating, not often remembered, little piece of scripture that frames our relationships. You see, humanity has fallen into sin in Genesis chapter 3. And God speaks a consequence of the sin, a consequence of choosing to live how we want to live. He said, there's a consequence for you guys choosing to live apart from me. In fact, he goes on to call it a curse. There's a curse or a cost, a consequence to life without God. You see, sin violates relationships. Its very nature, the very nature of sin is to break and violate relationship. In Genesis chapter 3, the first piece of relation, relational breakdown that we see is between humanity and God. But the second dimension of relational breakdown that we see is between humanity and each other. Between one another. And so in Genesis chapter 3, the curse of sin which tears our relationships apart has a cost. And check out the cost. Genesis 3.16. Speaking to the woman. And you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. In other words, let me put this a different way. Because of the brokenness of sin, there is a power dynamic that is established in our relationships where we are constantly vying for power, vying for position, vying for authority. And this isn't just constrained to husbands and wives. We see this in all relationships. Just a chapter later in Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel end up in a fight with one of them killing the other. Power over one another starts to tear people apart. You see this power tension that we're saying, it ain't right, it's not fair. Why does one party get the power and the other party not is an indication that we are actually living in a fallen mindset. Because we are vying and playing the game of who gets the power. We are living in a world that is cursed and broken. We want to get our way. We want control in the relationship. This tension, this yearning, 
This power dynamic is not part of God's design. It is part of the curse of sin. Do you see how even our very response, I want power, I want authority in a relationship, says that we're actually buying into something that is broken. You see, at the very core, at the very center of this principle lies selfishness. This idea that we want control, we want direction, we want the relationship rather than in orienting and existing for the service of somebody else. No, we want the relationship to exist for the service of us. We orient and we build our relationships around serving us. And then we wonder why they're not fulfilling. We wonder why they're broken. We wonder why there's constantly tension I submit to you tonight that a relationship that exists for the service of you is not a relationship that is ever going to be healthy. And so Peter comes into this situation. He comes into this crazy situation where there is this insane power tension where the men of the culture hold all the power and the women have none and he gives a completely countercultural solution. You see, what we want to do is we want to balance the power scales, don't we? We want to say we should give more power and we should reduce power. We should balance it. But Peter does something entirely different, entirely more profound, and entirely life-changing. Something that breaks the curse of this tension that exists in our relationships. He says the resolution to the tension, the resolution to that anxiety, the resolution to that frustration you feel in the relationship you're in, where you're going, I just wish they would listen. I just wish they would do that one thing for me. I just wish they would honor me or love me the way I need to. I just wish, I just wish, I just wish. He says there's one thing and there's a solution that is going to break the curse. And it's not by better balancing things, it's actually by abandoning the pursuit of power altogether. The thing that breaks the curse of sin, the curse of this vying for power in our relationships, is not a balancing of the power, it is the abandoning of the pursuit of it altogether. You see, actually, when we start to wrestle with this text, both parties are called to elevate the position of the other both parties. They don't balance the scales, but what they do is they say, how can I elevate you? How can I elevate you? How can I elevate you? Instead of saying, how can I elevate myself? How can I elevate you? How can I honor you? How can I build you up? How can I meet your needs? How can I serve you? He says, when he says to the woman, in the same way you must accept the authority of your husbands, what he's saying is instead of fighting and warring against them, build them up. Build them up. Build them up. Build them up. But then he says something totally countercultural to the men. He says, in the same way you husbands should honor In a culture where you hold the power, you don't give honor to somebody that is beneath you. And what he says is, I want you to honor, to build up, to exalt, to lift up that which is beneath you according to your culture. I want you to lift them up. In fact, Peter says something so counterculture, he goes on to say that they are equal. That the wives are equal to the husbands. He is calling the husbands to elevate their wives, to build them up by stepping off their own thrones. By stepping off their position of authority and stepping into the place of the servant. Those who are not equal, God is creating and making equal. You see, in both parties, Peter is challenging them to do something incredibly difficult and incredibly profound. He's saying, serve the other. Freedom in our relationships. This is completely a counterculture. I, don't, I do not believe anybody else outside of Scripture and outside of the church would ever teach this idea. Freedom in our relationships is not found in liberation 
or attaining more power. It is found in serving the other. If you want to experience freedom in your relationship, if you want to experience freedom, not just in romantic relationships, but in any kind of relationship, adopt the posture of a servant. Adopt the position of saying, how can I serve you? So many of us come to our relationships with the question, what can I get out of it? What can I extract out of this relationship? How does it benefit me is our framework for our relationships. And what Peter is saying to us tonight is he's saying abandon that. Abandon it. And ask the question, how can you serve those around you? This is a challenging word tonight. You see how it doesn't just ignore the passage, but it elevates it. It says, whoa, wait a second here. There's a profound truth here. That freedom is found in service, not acquiring more. I've wrestled with this a great deal in even my own marriage. How do, we, and how do Laura and I walk this road? And my tendency, if I have sort of a, a bent in my relationship, my tendency is to want to just empower Laura to do whatever Laura wants to do to try and balance the scales, to never, you know, tell her what to do, to never shift things, to just kind of say, like, Laura, you do you, and I'll do me, and we'll make it a day, and it'll be fine. A number of years ago, this came to a head, because it was a very interesting situation. Laura, my wife, is incredible, incredibly talented at her job. She's a, a publicist and works in public relations, and she was working with some of the, the top speakers and preachers anywhere in the world. But she was offered a new job a kilometer from our house. She was commuting into Toronto, and it paid more. It was better logistics, doing a, a job of, that she would have enjoyed, and it would have been influential. And, I, and so we had a job offer on the table. And all of a sudden, decision-making gets very real. All of a sudden, there's a decision with cost how we live our lives, how we manage our finances, where we live, how we serve this church, all of that is thrown into the mix. Do you know what I did? I did nothing. I, lo this, I, I looked at the situation, and I was more concerned with balancing power than I was with serving Laura. Laura. The question in my mind was, how do I make sure I don't step on Laura? How do I make sure she's free to decide what she wants to decide? Church, that's not the question I should have been asking. The question I should have been asking was, how do I honor my wife? How do I serve my wife? And had I been asking that question, I would have learned and realized in that moment what Laura needed was clear, concise, and succinct input from me and direction from me in this decision. But I never gave it. Because I wanted to make sure the power was balanced. But that's not what we're called to. My job was to serve her. And I didn't do it in that moment. And it created a ton of chaos. A ton of up and downs. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but it was, it was not, not a good situation. Not how you want to handle a job prospect. You see, when the primary motivation of our relationship is who is in control, we are asking the wrong question. You see, we look at this as a commentary on control. It's not. It's a commentary on service. And because we look at it from a control perspective, we cry out, it's unfair. But when you look at it from a service perspective, how do we serve? It starts to make some sense. And many of you are frustrated in your relationships because you're vying for control. You're vying for influence. And what, what Peter is saying to us tonight is if we could learn to submit to one another, to serve one another. You have to understand that we look at this text and we come to it out of context. Peter has just finished giving instructions to slaves. 
And he says to the slaves, if you want to get a more complete treatment of this, go to watch last week's sermon. But he had just finished saying to the slaves, you need to submit to and serve those in authority over you. But then he calls them to be faithful in the midst of a trial by doing what? By appealing to them to follow Jesus. By pointing them to Jesus. The verse immediately before this opens with this. For God called you, verse 21 of chapter 2, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. In the same way, in the same way, you must follow Christ. What did Christ do? He put himself on a cross to save us. Jesus was always more motivated by service than he was by control. Jesus was always more motivated by service than he was by control. And you see, what we do is we come to a text like this and we interpret it in terms of the 21st century, in light of the 21st century. What we need to do is we need to come to a text like this and interpret it in terms of Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Matthew 20, 21. This is, I think, the seminal passage that defines how our relationships ought to function. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. The seminal passage on relationships from Jesus says that if we want to be effective in our relationships, if we want to see things accomplished, that then instead of vying for control and influence, we need to accept and assume the position of the servant, men and women. You see, so often we come to our relationships and we're like, all right, you bring your 50%, I'll bring my 50%, I'll leave my other 50% in the bank for when I get bored and get tired of you. And we'll bring our two 50%s and we'll make 100%. That's not how relationships are built. If you want to build a healthy marriage, if you want to build a healthy relationship, it's not 50% plus 50%. It's you take your 100%, you take yourself, and you die to yourself. You kill your ambitions and your dreams, you leave them over there. The other party does the same, kill your ambitions and dreams, leave them over here. And you come and you form a new 100% together. A relationship is not 50-50, it's death and resurrection. Healthy relationships are not formed by you bringing your part and the other person bringing their part. It's by both of you dying to yourself and saying, I will serve the other. What if next time you get into a disagreement in a relationship, you pause? You hit pause, and you ask yourself the question, how can I serve them? How can I love them? Come on, how does that change the, the discussion? First of all, that'll immediately deal with any petty argument you will ever have, guaranteed. Because you'll realize it's petty and it's stupid, and you can get over yourself. If you start to frame your relationship on the basis of service, husband, wives, submit to Serve, accept the position of your husbands. Husbands, elevate the position of your wives. Serve them, honor them. They are equal. You see how that all of a sudden changes the dynamic? Instead of vying, we release. Instead of clinging to, we release. Instead of holding tight, we release. There's a cool picture that Peter gets to. In telling us a story about Sarah. So you got, you know, Abraham, father of many nations. Father Abraham has many sons. I am one of them. So are you. Left arm, right arm, left leg, right leg. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> all the people that grew up in church are like, holla. All the people that didn't grow up in church are like, you guys are weird. You were weird before, but now you're really weird. <laughs> there are some benefits to not growing up in church. <laughs> Anyway, there's this guy, Abraham, and uh, 
God calls him. He says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. He promises that, that there's going to be abundance in his future. He has no kids. His wife Sarah is getting old and, and a famine comes. And eventually these two end up creating a nation that is the nation of Israel. I'm going to get back to the famine in a second. And a lot of the identity of the people that Peter is writing to were formed by these two people, Abraham and Sarah, the patriarch and matriarch of sort of the whole thing. Now, it's fascinating. Peter says, you wives need to be like Sarah who obeyed her husband and called him Lord. Now, here's the, the hilarious thing about what we do when we start to dig into this. Is that there's one case where Sarah kind of calls Peter, or sorry, Abraham Lord, and she's being sarcastic when she says it. And so this leads commentators and theologians to go, what is Peter trying to get at here? Like, what's this really about? Because we can't quite seem to figure it out. But there's one instance where Sarah does what Abraham asks her to do. And it's a fascinating story. See, there was a famine in the land. And so Abraham's like, all right, we're going to go to Egypt. They got food down there. We're going to go hang out with them. And on his way down, he's like, he realizes that he's got a problem. Sarah's a really good-looking lady. He's married to Sarah, and he's going, here's what they're going to do. They're going to kill me and take you as their wife. God's given him a promise that he's going to make a nation out of him, but Abraham starts to fear. He starts to doubt the promise. He starts to doubt the truth. And so Abraham, in his own human wisdom, concocts a plan. And the plan goes like this. Sarah, you need to tell these people that you're not my wife, but you're my sister and you're available. It's a really dumb plan. We later find out. A really terrible plan. But Sarah says, okay, I'll go along with it. She listens to Abraham. Now, there's something profound that actually happens here. You see, Abraham in this moment is a man that is not listening to the word of God in his life. He is taking the word of God and he is ignoring it. The same as the husbands of the wives that Peter is, spo- or that, that Peter is speaking to. Same situation. Husbands who don't want to listen to God. And yet Sarah says, I'm going to listen to you. Here's why this is so significant. Sarah chose to suffer so that Abraham might live. Sarah chose to sacrifice herself, her own interests, for the benefit of her husband that was ignoring God. To quote a a theologian, named Ida Spencer, she writes this. Instead, Sarah chose to save her husband's life. She made a choice to obey or listen to Abraham in this event because she was willing to vicariously suffer for Abraham. This is what Peter is inviting us to. To a place where we begin to actually be willing to serve even at cost to ourselves, our spouses those in relationship. And if we understand the context, we see that this isn't even isolated to husbands and wives. I would argue this is the defining factor of all Christian relationship. You see, what Sarah did is she imitated Christ thousands of years before Christ came. Peter has already pointed to Jesus and said, Jesus is our model. He who sacrificed himself that we might live. That is the standard to which we are called in our relationship. The question is not, how do I get more control? How do we balance the control? The question is so much more profound. How do we serve? How do we, how do we serve? Even when they're in the wrong, how do we serve? Even when they're frustrating, how do we serve? And in this way, we start to imitate and look a lot like Jesus. Now, deep down... We're a little bit uncomfortable with this, aren't we? Deep down, we, we get to this and we go, hold on a second. This is completely upending my, my vision for my relationship. 
And this moves me from my first S to my second S. The first S was service. The second S is satisfaction. You see, deep down, our relationships, we think they exist for the benefit and the service of us. We think our relationships exist so that our lives can be made happier and joyful and we can have the things that we desire. And Peter is saying, actually, our relationships don't exist so that we can be personally fulfilled. They exist so that we can serve and fulfill somebody else. He goes on in verse 6. He says, you are her, Sarah's daughters, when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Now, I've already clarified that this isn't talking about abuse. This is talking about something very specific. You see, in the Roman culture, the, me- the, the head male of the household usually the husband, but whoever the head male was, determined the faith system and religion of the whole household. You couldn't violate whatever they said. Whatever they said went. And so if they said, we're worshiping Caesar, we're worshiping Caesar. If they say, we're worshiping the grain, we're worshiping grain. If they say, we're worshiping the Toronto Maple Leafs, we're worshiping the Toronto Maple Leafs. Or if you're Alex, the Green Bay Packers. Alex doesn't worship the Green Bay Packers. If I knew something about football, I would follow up with a quick quip like, you would never worship a losing team, but I don't know if they're a losing team or not. (laughs) I had to ask him what a Packer was this week. Anyway, (laughs) you see, to fail to listen to the husband's religion was actually to be condemned on a charge of atheism. And so the wives find themselves in this precarious situation. They've discovered the hope of Jesus but they're violating their husbands. And so they live in a fear, in a tension between the two. And so Peter does something really profound. He says, you need to continue to exist within the relationship, even though there's tension there. In other words, even though this relationship is no longer necessarily satisfying or fulfilling or in your interest, you need to continue to exist in it. Next week, we're going to talk about the objective of that, but I want to talk about the presupposition of that first. You see, we think our relationships exist to fulfill us. We enter into relationship and say, I hope it fulfills me. I hope it satisfies me. For many of us, we step into relationships because we're lonely. And we're saying, I hope they they quell the feeling of loneliness that I feel. And what Peter is saying is, there's a situation now that comes in your relationships where that fulfillment is no longer being satisfied. Where your sense of butterflies has gone away. Your sense of the easy days has gone away. Your sense of peace and satisfaction in the relationship, it's, it's gone away. It's no longer there. And now you're in a situation where it's hard. Where it's hard. Where it's difficult. Now what do you do? You see, if we've built our understanding of relationships on this idea that it exists to fulfill us and exists to satisfy us, we will find ourselves in situations where we will despair because it is hard. And what Peter says is you are called to persevere. This is the difference, church, between a covenant and a contract. Most of your relationships are contractual. What that means is that most of your relationships are based on some sort of mutual benefit to somebody else. You go to work, your job is you're paid to benefit the company. You pay to attend lectures, unless you go to Mohawk College. (laughs) That's because they're on strike. (laughs) That wasn't some sort of like undercutted dig or anything like that. I should have just said any college. Maybe that's where, anyway. We love you. You're here. Anyway, you, you pay and you get a service in return, right? 
or you're paid and you give a service. Most of our relationships are contractual. Even friendships a lot of the time can be contractual. We'll continue to survive or invest in a relationship so long as it's good for us, so long as it feels good, so long as it's beneficial. And what Peter says is, hey, that's not the kind of relationship that you're called to in the context of marriage. No, a marriage is built on not a contract on mutual benefit. It is based on a covenant of mutual service. Do you see the difference? The contract is based on benefit, what you can get out of it. A covenant is based on what you can give how you can serve. And the beautiful thing is that a covenant can never be broken because you always have the option and the power and the ability to serve. How many of you come to relationships and you go, you complete me, you satisfy me, you fulfill me? Church, what Peter is saying to us is that that's not the kind of relationships that we will ever experience. Marriage is not about fulfillment and completion. It's about service. But so often what we do is we come to our relationships and we try to squeeze and wring fulfillment out of it. but it simply doesn't contain it. It simply doesn't contain it. This is why in verse 5, in the midst of a great trial, in the midst of great challenge, in the midst of these difficult relationships, Peter gives the solution. He says, this is what your relationships are built on. This is the foundation that it is built on. Verse 5, they put their trust in God. They put their trust in God. You see how all of a sudden the foundation of the relationship isn't the quality of what we're receiving. It's what's already been done for us by our Savior. And so what we do is we come to our relationships we come to marriage with the intention of it fulfilling, with the intention of it satisfying, with the intention of it answering the deepest longings of our hearts. We look at relationships, even if you're the youngest person in the room. So many of us look at a relationship and go, Jesus, you just got to bring me the right girl and the right guy. And you come to church and all of a sudden everybody's a prospect. Maybe they're the one, maybe they're the one, or maybe they're the one. I had a friend who, I'm not exaggerating, invited a girl on a date every, 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 like every week. He would just go from one to the other, just trying to find the one, you know? One of them's eventually going to say yes. Because so often we come to relationships with our eye on everybody else, but our heart's only interested in ourselves. We come to our relationships with our eye on everybody else. Maybe they'll satisfy me. Maybe they'll satisfy me. Maybe they'll fulfill me. Maybe they'll complete me. Maybe they'll... Church, no human person can bear the weight of responsibility of satisfying your soul. No human person can bear the weight of the responsibility of satisfying your soul. And so Peter says, put your trust in God. My question is, the only way we're going to be able to understand the depths of how beautiful and liberating this is, is when our hope and our joy is in Jesus. You see, what, what Peter is inviting us to do tonight is not to be a people who are satisfied in a relationship, but a people who are satisfied in Jesus whose hope is Jesus, whose foundation is Jesus, whose joy is Jesus. And then we can come to our relationships without trying to pull fulfillment out of them. Rather, we can pour the love of a father, the love of a God that gave his life for us into them. You see, when we have encountered the love of Jesus, 
when we make that our pursuit, when we make that our yearning, when we make that our ambition, all of a sudden we become filled. The loneliness, the searching, the yearning, the frustration gets filled with a joy. And for those of you in relationships, it is out of that joy that you can now serve. See, for many of us, the foundation of our relationships is our loneliness. It is our hope for satisfaction. What Peter says is, he says, put your trust in God. Put your trust in Jesus. He will fulfill you. He will sustain you. He will carry you. He is the one who can satisfy the depths of the yearning of your human soul. Can we bow our heads tonight?